Section 5.5 is on antiderivatives, sometimes called indefinite integrals. And as the name implies, we're going to be going backwards from derivatives. We'll be using the integral notation, which you know to mean area, and make the connection between these antiderivatives in that area in a future lesson. Just a quick explanation as to what we mean by this word indefinite. We talked about definite integrals previously. A definite integral is when you have that integration sign and you have limits like one to five of some function. And we took an area approach to that. An indefinite integral, and you'll see it reflected in the problems that are coming up, is just that integral sign with some function that's sitting here. We're stepping away from this area interpretation of the integral to focus on these antiderivatives and how you find them. We will connect those two worlds with what's called the fundamental theorem of calculus, and that's coming in the next lesson. So first, what is an antiderivative? It is simply the inverse of differentiating. So we know how to do a derivative of x squared plus 3. That was a power rule, so the derivative of x squared is this 2x. The constant drops off, and that's why there's nothing there. When we do an integral, we're doing an antiderivative. So I'm going to give you the derivative. That's what this 2x is, is the derivative. And you have to tell me what that original function is. So the question that goes through your mind is, this is the derivative of what? And that's what's going to answer that integral question. So if I am just looking at this 2x and I'm trying to work backwards to that original function, there is no way for me to recover that constant. And for that reason, we just write plus c at the end of all these antiderivatives to acknowledge that, yes, there could have been a constant, but I have no way of finding out what it actually was because it just disappears in that derivative process. A quick explanation as to what I mean by a family of functions. As you recall, this plus c results in a vertical shift. When I do that antiderivative and I come up with this x squared plus c, what that results in is some quadratic x squared that has some vertical shift that I'm calling plus c. And you see the family of functions represented in this graph over here. They're all the same. They just have a different vertical shift associated with them. But they all have the same derivatives because if I do the derivative of x squared plus c, doesn't matter what that c is, it's going to become 0 anyway, and its derivative is still going to be 2x. So all of these graphs that you see represented here, all three of them, and there's an infinite number of other ones, they're all going to have a derivative of 2x. Here are a couple more examples to illustrate that inverse relationship between a derivative and an integral. The derivative of 3x to the fourth is just a power rule bring down the power, subtract 1 from the power, I get 12x cubed. What the integral question is going to ask is, given this 12x cubed, and don't let that dx throw you off, just a reminder that this dx and this integral sign are just part of the notation. They serve as bookends to this integrand that you're trying to find the antiderivative of. The question that goes through your mind is, this is the derivative of what? What answers that question is 3x to the fourth. Don't forget that we have that plus c tacked on to the end to acknowledge the fact that there could have been a constant, or in this case there wasn't one, but we have no way of knowing that when we are just looking at the integral. And then another one that involves trig, the derivative of sine x minus 1. Derivative of sine x is that cosine x. So if I'm asked, what is the antiderivative of cosine x dx? What answers that question? This is the derivative of what? Well, that would be sine x. And again, my plus c tacked onto the end. A little reminder over here, don't forget that plus c. Whenever you have an antiderivative, as noted by an integral sign with no limits on it, you're going to have to remember to write plus c on all of those. Down here at the bottom of the page, you have all the antiderivatives that you need to know. This first one is the power rule. So basically, it's just going to go the opposite of that derivative power rule. You're going to add 1 to the power. So add 1 to the power, then divide by the new power. And don't forget your plus c. I have that written in words here. Some rules for using this power rule. And they're going to mimic the power rule for derivatives. You have to make sure that if you have a variable in the denominator that you do a rewrite with a negative exponent. Also, if you have a radical, 
that you rewrite that as a fractional exponent formatted power over root prior to doing your power rule. The next six are related to the trig functions. I have written in red below each one of these, the derivatives that we did back in the day. Derivative of sine x is cosine x, therefore the antiderivative of cosine x dx equals sine x. And then that arbitrary constant written at the end. What you see at the bottom, written in red for all of these, are the derivatives that we've already talked about. These integrals are just going backwards, so I am giving you that derivative value, and you are telling me what that original function is. So you're just working backwards with these. The bottom two go into the exponential. Derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Therefore, the antiderivative of e to the x is also e to the x. For the natural log, since the derivative of the natural log is 1 over x, the antiderivative of 1 over x is the natural log of x. Notice the absolute values that I have here. That's just to ensure that that argument of the natural log stays positive because you can't natural log a negative number. You will have to have all of these antiderivatives memorized, but if you have the derivatives memorized and you did back in the day, then uh, it's just working them backwards. Let's take a look at a few examples so you can see how all of this works. The first one, I have the antiderivative of 2x to the fifth plus 3x squared plus 4 over x squared dx. The first thing I'm going to do is apply one of those integral properties that says across these plus signs, I can do an antiderivative and integral to each term separately. You don't actually have to write down three separate integrals like I did, but I want you to recognize that it is just that integral property in action that I'm doing. The only change I made besides separating it out is when I had this x squared appearing in my denominator, that required a rewrite with a negative exponent, and I did that right here. So now I'm going to apply my power rule. Basically, these are all polynomial in structure. I'm going to add one to the power and divide by the new power. Here's what my antiderivative looks like. So I started with this first one. I add 1 to the 5, become 6, divide by the new power, which is 6. The second one, add 1 to the power of 2, becomes a 3, and then divide by that new power. Be careful with the negatives. So when I add 1 to negative 2, it becomes a negative 1, divide by negative 1. At that moment when you do that antiderivative, that's when you put the plus C. And the rest of this is just simplifying. Here is my final simplified answer. Realize that all of these antiderivatives can be checked just by doing the derivative. So you can do a quick check on this. You don't have to write it down, but maybe just a quick mental check. So here's my check on this. I'm just going to do the derivative of my answer and see if I end up at the original question. Derivative of 1 third x to the 6, a power rule. That's going to become 2x to the 5th. Derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. If I rewrite this as 4x to the negative 1 and do that derivative, this becomes 4x to the negative 2. My plus c just zeroes out, and I see that this answer that I got totally matches with what the original question is. In question 2, it looks a lot like that third term in question number one, but if I try to approach it the same way that I did that one, which is to bring that x to the numerator, when I do that power rule of add one to the power, divide by the new power, this becomes x to the zero divided by zero, and divided by zero is undefined, which means that's not the way to go with number two. It got me through that portion on the first question, but not the second one. This is where the natural law comes in. Uh, there was an integral property that said I can take that 4 and pull it to the outside. So when I look at this and I ask myself that question, 1 over the x is the derivative of what? The answer to that is the natural log of x. And again, to keep that x a positive number, I'm going to put the absolute value around it. Don't forget your plus c. And that is my answer to the second one. In question number 3, to help you recognize the properties that we're using and why we covered them, the first thing I'm going to do is split this across the plus sign, and I'm going to pull this 5 to the outside of the integral sign. Secant x tangent x is the derivative of what? That's the question that goes through your mind. It's the derivative of secant x, so this first part's just going to say 5 times secant x. And sine x 
is the derivative of negative cosine x. A common mistake is to uh, get these signs confused because you know that derivative of sine x is cosine x, but remember we're working this backwards. So derivative of cosine x is negative sine x along with that negative is this positive sine x. And don't forget your plus c. In the fourth example, just like I did previously, I'm going to first split this up across these plus signs and I'm also gonna rewrite this radical using a rational exponent. So three separate antiderivatives to do. The first one is just gonna be a power rule. So I'm gonna add one to the power and divide by the new power. In the next one, I know that cosine x is the derivative of sine x. And in this last part, I know that e to the x is its own derivative and its own antiderivative. And then also my plus c at the end. When I look at this, I can simplify this front part a little bit. When you divide by a fraction, you multiply times its reciprocal. And that gives me my final antiderivative answer. The remaining four, I need to do a little bit of work at the front end before I can do an antiderivative of it. We're actually gonna learn a different method for doing this one in number five. But for right now, with the knowledge that you already have, what we're gonna do is go ahead and just expand this binomial out. It's only to the second power, so it's pretty easy to do. And once I do that, I see I just have a trinomial. So term by term, I'm gonna apply the power rule. I add one to the power, divide by the new power on each one of these. On the one, one is the derivative of one x. You could literally apply the power rule if you wanted to. Just think of this as being x to the zero. And if you add one to the power, it becomes a one, and then divide by the one, you end up here. And I'm just gonna simplify my coefficients of those first two terms. And that gives me this as my final antiderivative. In the next question, I see that one over cosine squared x, which the way it sits isn't the derivative of any of the functions that I recognize. But recall the reciprocal function that one over cosine x equals secant x. So I can rewrite this part so that it is the derivative of something that I recognize. For this first term, I took that constant multiple of five and pulled it to the outside. So I'm just doing the antiderivative of e to the x, which is five e to the x. In the second part, I do recognize the secant squared x now as being the derivative of tangent x. And along with that plus c, that becomes my final answer. In question number seven, what I see is my integrand is a quotient, and I don't have a quotient rule for antiderivatives, but what I can do is simplify this algebraically first by dividing each term in the numerator by that x to the fifth. And then when I see all these x terms in the denominator, I need to move them to the numerator by using negative exponents. And that sets me up to use my power rule, add one to the power, divide by the new power, just be cautious of the negatives happening here. So we add one to negative three becomes negative two and then divide by the negative two. Add one to the negative four becomes a negative three, divide by the negative three. Add one to the negative five, it becomes negative four, and then divide by that negative four. The rest of this is just gonna to be to simplify this answer. Oh, don't forget your plus C here. And here is my final and simplified answer. Number eight is about as complicated as it gets, and it's going to combine a couple of these techniques that we've talked about. I'm going to go ahead and expand this numerator. I'm gonna treat this as x to the one half, and I'm gonna move it up here and call it x to the negative one half. That's gonna be my first move. This binomial expanded out as this trinomial. The square root of x is this x to the negative one half uh, that's outside of the parentheses. And now what I'm gonna do is take this x to the negative one half and distribute through the parentheses. Keep in mind the property of exponents. If you're multiplying, say x squared times x to the negative one half and you have the same base, in this case x, what I'm gonna do with these exponents is add them. This x to the negative one half times x squared, think of this uh, power of two as being four over two, minus one over two leaves me that three over two. Negative six x to the first power, if I add the one to the negative one half, that leaves me a one half power. And then this nine x to the negative one half. Once I'm sitting at this step, now I can apply my power rule. For each term individually, add one to the power, divide by the new power. So x to the three halves, add one to three halves, we get five halves and divide by that. 
Add 1 to the 1 half, we get 3 halves. Add 1 to the power, divide by that new power. And the same with the negative 1 half. Add 1 to it, we get a 1 half and divide by the 1 half. The calculus is actually over at this step. I'm going to clean up a little bit to get rid of these complex fractions. When you divide by 5 halves, it's the same as multiplying by 2 fifths. Here is my antiderivative. If you wanted to, you could always switch these back to radical notation if you wanted to. Or you could just leave it as fractional exponents like I did. Just a couple of reminders to head off some issues that commonly show up. Make sure you only use the power rule when you have a power function. Don't try to use it on a trig function or an exponential or logarithm. And also don't forget your plus c. It's going to show up every time to represent that constant that could have been part of the original problem.